let's talk about kind of, so what we're going to be doing today is mostly talking more precisely about what it means to compute things and what mathematical constructs we're going to need in order to, uh, to define that properly. So when we talk about what does it mean to compute, we're going to discuss several ideas for that this semester. There is no singular model of computation that everybody just uses. Instead, there are several models of computation that people tend to use in various different circumstances. We're going to talk about what, in those, what, mod what those models of computation are and what circumstances they're going to be most useful in. But, the, but for all of them, we're going, to be, we're going to have sort of the same vague idea. Our vague idea for what it means to compute is that we have some sort of machine or algorithm or program or some sort of black box implementation thing which will take an input somehow and then produce some useful output. So this is our vague idea of what it means to compute. Things that compute just take inputs and produce outputs. And a computer is the implementation that figures out which output to produce depending on that input. So that is our vague idea of computing. Everything we see is going to have the same shape to it. Some sort of weird device thing that uh, takes inputs and produces outputs. What are the types of the inputs and outputs? What does an input look like? What does an output look like? What are the what are some thoughts that you might have about this? Yes. Okay, so maybe a number. Uh, maybe our inputs are numbers and our outputs are numbers. Other ideas, yeah. An image, our input is an image, our output is an image, sure. What else? Okay, so maybe finite strings of symbols are our inputs and outputs. What else? Sound, so maybe we have some sort of sound wave or something like that as our input and our output, yeah. Some sort of electrical signal could be our input and output, sure. Any piece of data that could convey a meaning, sure. So yeah, these are all lots of ideas. All of these are definitely things that we might want to see as inputs or outputs. We don't want to have a different theory for sound for how we compute on sound waves versus images versus numbers. We want to have ideally some theory of computation that's going to work for all of those. We want to figure out what should the types of these things be so that when we're talking about computing where our inputs and outputs are of that type, that's going to apply to if that type happened to uh, kind of refer to an image versus if it referred to a number. So we want sort of a super class of all of these things. So um, if we look at Alan Turing's paper, so this is, this is the title of Alan Turing's paper where he introduced the Turing machine. He did not call them Turing machines because he was not that vain. But he titled this Uncomputable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidungs Problem. Uh, the Entscheidungs problem, that was the, the thing that we mentioned last class was what Hilbert, David Hilbert, mentioned. Uh, that was the problem of automated theorem proving. So you can already see that there's sort of two types that he's talking about just in the title of this paper. We're computing with numbers, and then we're applying that to the Entscheidungs problem, which is asking about theorems. So he's talking in the title of this paper about his model of computation that can somehow simultaneously talk about computing where the inputs and outputs are going to be numbers, and also when they can be, uh, let's say, logical statements, logical expressions of some kind. So you can see just from this that whatever we're going to talk about needs to be general for all of the things that we mentioned. What we're going to end up computing on is instead of having... Uh, the idea is that we're going to be computing on things that can be representations of other things. So we're essentially going to be computing on representations. Whatever type that we're going to have, we want that to we want to be able to consider that as a rep representation of various other things that that we might uh, be hoping to compute on. For instance, images or or um, audio signals or something like that. And what we're going to end up using is what somebody in that general area said. We're going to end up computing on strings. So strings are going to be sufficiently general, a sufficiently general type of thing for us to compute on. Any sort of data that you might want to compute on, um, you can represent that as a string. So if we can talk about computing on strings, then we can talk about computing on anything else. We just have to convert that thing into a string first. A string in this case is just going to be some sort of ordered sequence of characters. Whoever mentioned what, whoever mentioned uh, this idea before, added in the statement of it is a finite ordered sequence of characters. 
That is going to be important eventually. The idea is that that string is going to be the representation of something, like a number. How do we know that strings can represent sort of anything? So how do we know that, that strings are going to be sufficient, at least for all the computing that you can do with your laptop? Yeah, so, so we said strings are just ordered sequences of characters. Typically, when we think about how computers are representing data, we say that they're bits. They're ones and zeros. We sometimes also call those bit strings. Uh, because it is an ordered sequence of ones and zeros. Those ones and zeros, those are the characters. So your computers already do this. They exclusively compute on ones and zeros that happen to manifest as electricity in your, in your CPU, but they're just sequences of characters. Sequences of ones and zeros is what your computer actually computes on. So everything that you know that computers can do, we can represent that by by uh, operating on just strings of ones and zeros. Um, our, a string is an ordered sequence of characters. Uh, it's going to re we're going to be using it to represent things potentially, and these characters are going to come from something that we call an alphabet. So let's formally define strings. In order to define our strings, the first thing I want to define is an alphabet. What is an alphabet? An alphabet is a finite set of characters. It must always be finite. So that's all that it is, a finite set of things that we're just going to consider to be characters is what we call an alphabet. Typically, when we uh, denote what the alphabet is, we use the Greek letter capital sigma. Uh, well, you're typing up your LaTeX stuff, the way that you write down that, that uh, letter is by doing backslash capital S sigma. That's how you write that character in LaTeX. Uh, some examples of alphabets that you've probably seen before. 0, 1, we call that uh, the binary alphabet. We also have A through Z. Uh, maybe we'll call this um, the Sesame Street alphabet. We also have 0, 1, 2, etc., all the way through 9. So 0 through 9. Maybe we'll call this one the uh, decimal alphabet, something like that. All of these are just alphabets. And strings of these things are things that we can talk about, uh, strings over this alphabet are things that we can talk about computing on. So we could talk about computing where we have base 10 numbers. Babbage's machine actually computed with base 10 numbers. Uh, we could talk about computing with binary. That's what pretty much every modern computer is going to do. Uh, we could talk about computing with other bases if we wanted to instead. There are actually um, some, some RAM technologies that essentially represent things in base 8. So you have kind of one cell of your RAM that, that can represent any digit 0 through 7 um, in that case uh, by having different levels of, of voltage, essentially. Um, fascinating things there. Yeah, so we could, any set of characters that you could consider, that is a valid alphabet. Once we've selected an alphabet, we can talk about strings over that alphabet. Typically, we, we take something like sigma to the power n and say that that represents the set of all length n strings over an alphabet. So strings are going to be ordered sequences of characters over an alphabet. And the way that we can get ordered sequences of characters is by doing things like sigma to the power n. So for instance, we do 0, 1 to the power 3. What does it mean for us to actually raise a set to a power, first of all? What does it mean to raise a set to a power? Right, so, so when, we, when we raise, let's say, an integer to a power, that says that we're going to multiply that integer with itself many times. When we raise a set to a power, that says we're going to sort of multiply that set with itself many times, that many times. Uh, in this case, multiplying sets, when we say we multiply two sets, we mean we're doing the cross product or the Cartesian product of those sets. 0, 1 to the power 3, the set 0, 1 raised to the power 3, that means that we're doing the cross product or Cartesian product of that set 0, 1 with itself three times. What we end up with then is triples of elements from that set, triples of zeros and ones. Usually, when we write down Cartesian products, we have kind of these, these tuple representation. We have parentheses with commas in between them and so forth. So we say that, for instance, uh, 0, 1, 0 might be, this might be one of the tuples, one of the elements of 0, 1 to the power 3. 
Um, oftentimes, though, when we're when we're discussing strings, we can just as a shortcut, as a convenience, remove the parentheses and commas. So now we can say zero comma one comma zero is just going to be this one there. Where we just drop the commas and the parentheses as a notational convenience. So this is how we can talk about strings of a certain length. Uh, for instance, all the strings of length three, all the strings of length 17, whatever. We can also talk about strings of any length using something called the Claney star operator. A lot of people say this is the clean star. Um, I've heard sort of third hand that it ought to be uh, pronounced as Claney. I heard this from Jack Davidson, who said that he heard that it should be cl pronounced Claney by the son of the namesake. So I think that that's somewhat trustworthy. So I've chosen to refer to this as Claney. If you say clean instead, I'm not going to care. So this is uh, the Claney star operator. The way that we write this down is we sort of take a set and then raise it to the power of star, of asterisk. So sigma star represents the set of all strings over an alphabet of any length. So the set of all possible strings of any length, including zero. So zero is one of the lengths of strings that we want to have within this set. So in particular, if we want to formally define this, we're going to say that for instance, the set 0, 1, star represents um, the set of all tuples where we have like x sub 0, x sub 1, all the way up through x sub n minus 1 for every choice of n and every possible choice of what from our alphabet x0 through x n minus 1 could be. So in particular, when we look at the definition, when we look at what belongs to 0, 1 star, <clears throat> we have all of the strings of length 0 are within this set 0, 1 star. That means the empty string is the only set of length 0. Um, your textbook uses uh, double, double quotes uh, to represent the empty string. Sometimes you might also see um, a lowercase epsilon refer to the empty string. Um, so that is another thing that might be the empty string. Another way to write that lowercase epsilon is as a backwards three. So there are several different ways that one could write the empty string. Um, sometimes people use lambda to represent the empty string as well. Uh, we'll mostly be using double quotes. Uh, we also have all of the strings of length one. So that's just zero and one. Then we have all the strings of length two and then all of the strings of length three and then we'll have length four and so forth. So all of the strings of any length uh, are all elements of that 0, 1 star. Another way we could write this, we could say 0, 1 star is uh, the set 0, 1 raised to the 0 with power. Union with 0, 1 raised to the 1 power. Union with uh, 0, 1 raised to the 2 power and so forth. This symbol here is the set union symbol. In LaTeX, if you want to write that, it's backslash cup. Another equivalent way to write it is like this. Uh, this is another notation that, that we might see uh, throughout the semester. So this sort of acts like that big sum notation that you might see sometimes. If you talked about Taylor series in your calculus class, you had that big sum. Um, that big sum basically says we've got a shape that a bunch of terms are going to have. Here's how we plug in things to make those terms. And we combine those terms together with a plus is what the big sum notation means. In this case, the only difference is going to be we're combining those terms with a union instead of with a plus. So the way we read this is we say for every natural number n, we're going to union together 0, 1 to the n. So that ends up meaning the same thing as that sequence right there. So this, just, this just says 0 is a natural number, so we're going to take 0, 1 to the 0. 1 is a natural number, so we're going to take 0, 1 to the 1. How do we combine those? Because we had this big union symbol here, we're combining them with a union. We've talked about what types our inputs and outputs of our computer are going to have. Those are going to be strings. Our inputs and outputs are going to be strings. Um, this black box here is our, is our implementation of our computer, which we haven't defined yet. That's sort of going to be the last piece of the puzzle for us to figure out is how we might fill in that black box. That's going to be what we spend the majority of the semester discussing is, is various options for that. 
So we know what, sh what the input looks like. We know what the output looks like. I'm deferring what the black box is actually going to look like inside. What's going to be the goal of the black box, though? So what is it that so the black box is going to be implementing something as our computation? What is the thing that it is going to be implementing? What's our goal? We're, we're trying to compute a what? So we're actually going to talk about two things that we could be implementing. The first one is going to be a function. We can talk about implementing functions. Uh, the second thing, which we're going to sort of defer to later, uh, a language. We can talk about implementing a language. That's for another day. Don't concern yourselves with that just yet. So for now, we're going to say that the thing we're implementing is a function. 